Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I interview a serial entrepreneur in the tech world, which got me thinking about the Portland Incubator Experience Open Applications. First, what is Pi, why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? From the Pi website, with its origins in a conversation between Wyden and Kennedy, the largest privately held creative advertising agency in the world, and the Portland, Oregon startup community, the Portland Incubator Experiment, known more commonly as Pi, has become an ongoing experiment designed to enable established organizations, corporations, government, educational institutions, among others, to more effectively collaborate with startup communities in a mutually beneficial ways. Throughout its history, Pi has served as a created co-working space, a community event space, a startup accelerator, a flashpoint for corporate innovation, an accelerator for accelerators, and the home away from home for tech startups. But why is this important? It's important because Pi is currently accepting applications for their 2022 cohort of entrepreneurs, which means you, the listener, have an opportunity to apply to be part of this amazing product-focused early-stage startup accelerator. Benefits of the program includes accelerators of the SaaS and mobile startups, an accelerator partnership with Build Organ focused on growth start consumer products, and advanced manufacturing and prototyping through a partnership with Autodesk. I speak of networking often. In fact, some of my former guests on this show have worked with Pi, such as Brave Care and The Bitter Housewife. I've even interviewed Pi's general manager, Rick Terosi, on this podcast before. If you have not had an opportunity, please go back to listen to that conversation. It is a great episode. In fact, this next guest is a former mentor of the residency program in Pi. The best part about this program is that it does not matter where in Oregon you reside. This program is available to all entrepreneurs in the state, and there are Q&A sessions happening right now. And that is why an entrepreneur should care, because this program is free. No rent, no tuition, no equity, no cost. From the founder's perspective, this is a free and clear program. The only cost of the entrepreneur is taking time to develop a compelling application and taking the time to meet with the resources they encourage throughout the program. So, what are you waiting for? Applications deadline is March 14th. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest has been building consumer and business web apps as both a product designer and entrepreneur since 2005. Please welcome the CEO and founder of Pod and Box, Pat Chung. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the owner of Pod Inbox. I'm actually interested because it's about podcasts. I'm very get, I'm just, I'm just familiarizing myself with Pod Inbox. So, Pat, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm very intrigued about this because I think you and I, for the podcasting world, and then you actually have a healthcare background as well, right? So, mm-hmm. first, let's introduce the world to Pat. Who is Pat? Sure. Uh, Pat is, um, I guess, the co-founder, or I'm sorry, the founder of Pod Inbox. And um, yeah, I've been a product designer and a product manager for many years, uh, too many years for me to kind of <laughs> <laughs> reveal. <laughs> but I've been doing this for a long time, needless to say. And um, yeah, and 
right now doing a uh, pod inbox and just created this um, uh, tool for podcasters. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. What, what is pod inbox? Sure. Um, pod inbox is a fan engagement platform. Um, and basically what it does is it lets podcasters receive audio messages from fans. Is that all it does? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm like, wait, I'm like, come on. I know it's a little more. It's funny because in the startup world, they, te- you know, they kind of teach us to give the short elevator. Yeah, speech. that was definitely the shortest <laughs> elevator speech. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does a lot more. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, uh, how, how far, how far to dive into it. But um, yeah, as a fan engagement platform, um, uh, right now, that's one of the core features for okay. podcasters to receive audio messages from fans. So let's say you have, uh, you know, the Shades of E or the mm-hmm. Shades of Entrepreneur co- podcast. Uh, if you want to run fan engagement, mm-hmm. uh, like wh- what kind of tools do you use? Oh, like Instagram and basically BuzzFeeds, Clips, what's Canva, art kind of thing. Right. So it's very, very much uh, centered around social right now. Okay. Uh, so what we want to become is we want to be the tool uh, or at least one, one of the few tools you reach for when, uh, you know, someone asks you this question, what do you, yeah. what do you use for fan engagement? Uh, so, so how we do fan engagement, at least the core product is since podcasting is very audio format, right. why not receive audio messages from fans? Mm, nice. And podcasters love this because, uh, being an audio format, a lot of times they want to play back uh, clips from, from their fans. Very true. Uh, they need a way to capture that audio f- f- from the fans. So uh, when customer signs up for Pod Inbox, they mm-hmm. get a Pod Inbox page. And on that page is where you drive your fans to and say, hey, go leave me a message at podinbox.com slash shades of E or right. Gabriel, you know, whatever you want it to be. And we make it very easy for the podcast uh, for the podcast fan to go there and leave a message. Nice. Now, yeah. how did how did the concept kind of come about? How did you decide that this was a problem that needed to be solved? Yeah, good question. Because I am not a podcaster yet. <laughs> I'm actually an aspiring podcaster. Nice. So, uh, but I've been a podcast fan, uh, a listener for uh, yeah many years. Uh, maybe when maybe when podcasts first came about. Yeah. Um, and as a fan, I've always kind of been frustrated with the idea that, wow, I'm always listening to these people in my, uh, ear like 24 seven and never had a chance to kind of interact with them in the way I kind of wanted to, which is, uh, a lot of times, you know, just kind of having the wish of just kind of being on the show, uh, or making a cameo on the show. And yeah, not a lot of podcasters were doing it, uh, uh, when, when I really, you, you know, uh, throughout my time as a podcast listener. So kind of having that craving kind of caused me to, you know. Nice. Now, is this your first business? No, I guess uh, you could call me a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, been dabbling with entrepreneurship probably for maybe 20 years, you nice. know, uh, for a long time. And uh, this is probably, I don't know, I want to say maybe like fifth or sixth business. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, what else have we done? Well, I'll talk about the previous one. That was kind of like the more substantial business. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a venture funded business called Silver Sheet. It was also a software uh, uh, web software for um, healthcare facilities to manage their healthcare staff. Okay. Now you you mentioned actually that your your background is actually in healthcare, and so like some of these these years, how did you transition from healthcare to the podcast? Maybe to clarify, my background is really in product design. Okay. Um, so I was a UX designer kind of maybe even before uh, people were called UX designers. <laughs> you know, we used to be called information <laughs> architects for those people um, who are in the know. Um, so being a UX designer for a long time, I, I, I th- you think a lot about product. You think a lot about the user experience. And, of course, you have to actually uh, create the products that, that companies need, right? Right. Um, so did UX design for a long time. Uh, then, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, the, the life of a UX designer, uh, they usually kind of maybe graduate to the next level, which is product management. So okay. I've always, I've also been a product manager for a long time. So I wouldn't say my background is healthcare, but for the last, um, uh, six years, well, we ran Silver Sheet for about six years okay. uh, before it got, it got acquired about two years ago. Um, so yeah, have a little bit of a background in healthcare because of doing silver sheet as a startup. Okay. Yeah. 
So with, with your experience in product development, you know, you've, you've, you, let's kind of, let's go through the process for those at home that may not know the product development process. What, what, what do you go through when you're kind of thinking about, like, for example, pod inbox, how do you go from vision to end product? Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the processes, you know, I've used for a long time is called user centered design. Uh, in that process, you really have to think about the users of the product. So when I first came out with uh, Pod Inbox, um, I already knew a couple things. I knew I wanted to be in the podcast space okay, uh, because it's a space I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And when I was thinking about the next product that I was going to work on, I, I just really wanted to truly be in a space that I enjoy because yeah. I kind of know, you know, these things take a while. And uh, so I just told myself, what types of people do I want to surround myself for the next maybe six, seven years of my life? Yeah. So I've always enjoyed podcasts, uh, like I said earlier, but I've also enjoyed talking to podcasters. I feel like there's such a sort of a rainbow range of uh, podcasts out there that, but every, like the sort of the similarities about them is they're always kind of interesting people. So I just thought, you know, that's an industry I want to serve. Yeah. Somehow. So part of the user centered design process is just kind of talking to a lot of podcasters and trying to figure out what kind of problems they're trying to solve in their daily life. So when I um, basically looked across the industry, talked to a bunch of podcasters, one of the gaps that I saw was this kind of maybe problem or a need around fan engagement. Mm -hmm. There just weren't too many tools around there. So do you, you said you spent some time with podcasters to kind of understand what their kind of concerns were first, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How important is that when the product design development? Sure. It's, uh, I mean, yeah, when you're talking to um, like a UX designer, you know, with, with my philosophy on how to build a product, it's super important. Maybe, maybe one of the most critical things uh, you could do as an entrepreneur in, in the first steps, you talk to the users. Because those are the people who are theoretically going to buy your product. Um, so Pod Inbox is a paid product. Um, we, we might have something free later, but uh, it started out as a paid product to maybe kind of test what, what's people's willingness to buy. Mm. So, uh, you know, uh, because software development is such a sort of a lengthy and expensive process, you don't want to spend even one dime of building something before you kind of know that there's this need in the marketplace. So... Yeah, uh, talking to users, yeah, probably one of the first critical steps. Yeah, and that's the reason I asked this question because I think it's so important for the listeners at home to understand that as well. If you're going to into a product development, you know, thing, you you're, you must spend some time with your end users to kind of understand what their needs are, assuming their needs, and then trying to address the assumed need is never going to be good, right? It's not going to be <laughs> successful. So making sure that you really understand what their needs are uh, and going in there and, and having them test the product. Did you do some product testing with uh, with Podbox? I'll be honest, not really. I think, so after we kind of established their needs, kind of made sure they're there before building anything, you know, may, maybe this is not the right thing to do. I always say, uh, you know, tell people don't, don't follow exactly my steps. <laughs> <laughs> because I do take some short, I shortcuts. Um, uh, yeah, we just start building. And uh, in in the world of um, software, we build what's called an MVP, a minimum viable product. What do we think is the smallest amount of software we could build to keep validating? Is this a good product for them? Mm, Are we on the right yeah. track? So that's, yeah, right after, uh, you know, a lot of other people would take some other steps of like maybe, um, building like a prototype or like a wireframe just to kind of show users. We kind of skipped a couple steps there. <laughs> we just went right into the building. Yeah. That's fine too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things you, you kind of mentioned too is you, you made it a subscription model. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you, how did you kind of come up with that decision? You kind of briefly mentioned it, but just for the users at home that are thinking of, you know, creating some type of product, mm -hmm. going through that process, the decision process of should we make it a subscription model? Mm -hmm. Should we make it free? What did you do? How did you go through it? Sure. I mean, we're still playing around with the idea, like I said, maybe of a freemium later, but um, it is a subscription model, um, most likely because it kind of makes sense for the product. A lot of these. Mm -hmm. So we consider podcasters as a 
is a business. Yeah, um, very true. I don't know. Would you consider? I it? would consider it a business. Yeah. Right. Right. So, and a, a lot of businesses, and even consumers. So let's say they're, so if someone's podcasting is a business or as a hobby. Um, a lot of times they use tools, especially in this industry. Like mm-hmm. you probably have like, you know, a, a hosting tool, yep. um, audio editing tools, yep. so on and so forth. Like we're using you, mics. We got the yeah, mixers. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. And even the software, right? I think earlier you said you use Canva, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think when, uh, especially businesses think of getting jobs done, um, they think about, now subscription software so we kind of play pretty nicely in that field where you know if a podcaster really wanted to a a place to receive audio messages from fans there's quite honestly not a lot of options that's free out there right yeah there might be you might be able to use your voicemail or like google voice or something that's arguably free but not with the features that we have like our, our our platform is you know, we think much more engaging and fun and social than like a voicemail. Nice. Um, so yeah, if so yeah, that's why we pretty much from day one decided let's go SaaS uh, software as a service. Gotcha. Now, yeah. w- w- now you've, you've been in product development, you said for like over 20 years or, you know, a very long time. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of, what has been difficult? What, what are some difficult aspects in product development that, listeners should be mindful of if they are trying to get into a product development or they're thinking of building out a product, what are some pitfalls they should be aware of? You know, pretty much what we talked about uh, already about talking to your listen, uh, talking to your um, uh, potential customers yeah. first. Mm-hmm. Um, I see. So here, even in Portland, uh, you know, I, I, I try to mentor as much as possible. Other um, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. I feel like I've, kind of done it enough where I have some <laughs> insights that uh, could be useful for them so they don't make, you know, the same mistakes I did. And yeah. when I think about some of the critical mistakes I've kind of, you know, made in the past or in my early days of software entrepreneurship, it's around, probably it's around making too many assumptions, mm. right? A lot of times we think we know uh, what a problem is, but maybe not enough the new, uh, uh, not enough about the nuances of the problem to create a product that actually people will pay for. So, um, yeah, that's one big, big mistake, not knowing, um, the customer enough. So yeah, that's something I always recommend to yeah young entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've discussed it a few times on the show. I, it's, it's so important to have that opportunity to, you know, just watch, you mm-hmm. know, and understand the needs because again, we might know what, our needs and wants are, but that might not be the, you know, the majority. Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've, uh, what, what would you say has been difficult about starting the, the, the pod inbox for me? And is also the case with a lot of, um, I guess tech entrepreneurs or software entrepreneurs is marketing. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I think because we're kind of wired as builders, Yeah, we're usually not wired to, then tell people the world about what we built. So it's funny. I say marketing is um, probably, you, you know, the weakest part of, um, you know, my skills is cause I, you know, because of that lack of skill, mm-hmm. you know, I read about a lot about marketing and sales, but yeah, you know, I find that's still probably the hardest part building, you know, I could kind of do it in my sleep. I've done it for a long time and um, I like building. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there comes a time in everybody's business where you actually have to sell it. Yeah, so it's very, true, very true. Yeah. So going out to market and selling it, um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. How, how do you market to your clients? Well, um, that's a good question. Just to give some context, we just launched in August. Nice. Um, so that's only, I don't know when you're going to release this, but, you know, maybe five, six months ago, yep. uh, not too long ago. Um, and we launched at, uh, the biggest, con- uh, podcast conference. So, and that actually worked out really well. Nice. Um, we got a booth, uh, you know, I was kind of debating whether just to kind of, so at that point we, we just got our product ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of used that as the deadline <laughs> for us to have <laughs> to, you know, get our product ready. Cause I love it. Other than that, we didn't really have a deadline, you know, we could, yeah, kinda, yeah. uh, you know, just launch whenever. So. Uh, when we found out about that conference, we thought, you know what, let's make this as a deadline. And um, when that deadline came, we all, we had to make the decision, should we actually launch here or should we just kind of attend? 
and watch and observe. Yeah. So, um, you know, made the decision. No, let's let's get a booth and let's really find out what if people like this or not. Yeah. Because if they don't, you know, we could just pretty much, uh, you know, pack up what we did <laughs> and maybe move off to move on to the next startup or something. So, yeah. So that podcast conference is called Podcast Movement. We launched here in August and we got you know pretty good feedback actually. Yeah, not not much negative um, feedback at all. So we thought, well. I think that's a sign to um, maybe keep going. Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, mm-hmm. one of the things you mentioned again, and you're, I think you're just dropping some golden nuggets really for entrepreneurs to really pay attention to. One, obviously, you know, the customers, right? Really, really spending that time to understand your customer needs. But then two, right now, you mentioned taking your product out in the road, getting in front of, getting in front of people and getting real-time feedback. How important is, you know, getting real-time feedback for a product in product development? Yeah, I mean, yeah, feedback and talking to early customers. Like I said before, I'm going to probably sound like a broken record, no, but great. like super important. Like, you know, I think, you know, I could, I could even talk about, you know, some of the messed ups we had for the last, uh, my last startup, Silversheet. Um, you know, you know, we don't, we didn't, we don't talk about this too much, but in our last uh, startup, it was venture funded. We raised a lot of money. Um, and we probably wasted a year building the wrong product before oh, no. we found out. Yeah, we were actually building a product that was a little bit more like doctor on demand. It was at a time where Uber for X was like really popular. Mm, so yep. we were just trying to build like an like a Uber for doctors, uh for, for medical facilities. So that's gotcha. kind of uh partner with these different doctors. I think that's something you're familiar with, yes. right? Um but we found out uh yeah doctors aren't commoditized like that right? yeah <laughs> and they have all the sorts of credentials that can't, can't come with them and uh it's funny because my uh, you know other two co-founders for that product uh were, were medical doctors you know i think in our rush to maybe assume uh that uh, medical facilities always need more physicians and providers to work mm. with that there was nothing more to their hiring process than just saying, "Oh, that one looks good. Let's let's partner with them." Right. 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 <laughs> but as you you probably know, there's this whole uh, process in there called credentialing. Yes. Yeah. Very long, lengthy, a lot of paperwork process. Yeah. So it's like one of these things that a lot of people don't know about. So that's that's the problem we tackled was credential management, and uh, reali- we realized there's not there weren't a lot of solutions for the. Um, the segment we we targeted were ASCs, ambulatory surgery centers, mm-hmm. and these these smaller places. Not not like these big uh, healthcare organizations right. or hospital systems where they have a lot of money to spend on the software that w- that that's available to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still, this every and every um, medical facility that provides any kind of medical service or hires a doctor needs the same level of credential management. So a, yeah, we, we ended up building the software for them, but it didn't take, it took us about a year to kind of figure that out. <laughs> we kind of made that mistake of building the product. We, and then once we, you know, we're ready with it, we went out to market with it. They're like, we can't use this. <laughs> and this is with, you know, two doctors on the co-founding team, oh, you man. know, kind of thinking, we were able to do this. So, so how did you pivot from that? Yeah, it was a hard choice because at that time we already raised money, right? Yeah. Uh, we raised, uh, I, I can't remember how much, but it must have been a couple of million already. And we just thought, you know what, what we're doing is not going to work. So we just had to kind of bite the bullet and tell the investors we have to do something else. But I think before we told them, and this is all kind of hindsight is twenty twenty a little bit now. Things are a little fuzzy, but we had to tell we had to come up with another story before you know kind of maybe telling uh, some of the key investors so yeah. uh and that's where you know customer development what's called customer development when you talk to the customer to find out what the what their actual pain point is you know we found out that you know several of them uh maybe like a good percentage of them actually said hey do you have something for credentialing cuz that's something we could really use mm-hmm. like um yeah, we understand the pain point you guys are trying to solve in, in terms of um, hiring physicians real quick. But we need to solve this other thing first, which is credential management, which, mm. like you said, it takes a long time. Yes. So you were basically able to identify a new need. Yeah, yeah. Or a need that they had that we just did not see yeah. like, because of our own sort of biases. And that's that's just so crazy how, you know, again, we're going back to the same thing, you know, the, the need of, of 
kind of going and, and monitoring your customers and watching what their needs are, right? That's mm-hmm. so crazy how it all just intertwines like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and just, it's very holistic and organic, right? It's, you know, not like it was, it's just kind of like, hey, if you follow the, if you actually get out the directions from Ikea and you follow it, oh my God, I got a bookshelf. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> or just re- it's really just listening, right? I think a lot of, it's hard because as an entrepreneur, you're kind of taught like perseverance, right? Yeah. It's like perseverance that gets you through a bit. So it's, I can see it's gray for a lot of entrepreneurs where they're just like, hey, maybe if I just try a little bit harder, people will start buying. Or if we build a little bit more, you know, they'll overcome all the selves objections of mm-hmm. why people aren't buying. But uh, to your point, a lot of times it's just one, one step simpler, which is this listening. Like if you kind of just listen <laughs> to yeah. what your customers are saying, you can kind of see like, oh, they're not buying because they don't they can't use it or they don't want it or there's some other problem that's even more important that they have to solve. And you know, one of the things you mentioned too, is you had to go and resell this to your investors who, who who gave you millions to, for this product. How did, how did you guys, how did you manage that? (laughs) That just seems like a daunting task. Yeah. I mean, I'll have to say props to my, uh, the founder, uh, the the co-founder of um, having to block and tackle all the, all, all the investment talks. Um, but I think as a team, what we did was, yeah, we had to create an, an alternate plan, I think, mm-hmm. first, which is, well, we can't do doctor on demand. Is credential management a big enough industry? So, you know, we all ran the numbers around that and it kind of made sense, you know, kind of did a bottoms up approach market analysis of, you know, how much could we sell this for? What are they willing to buy it for? Right. And how many of these things are there right, yeah. in the country? And we thought that was kind of a big enough market. And and then, you know, the bigger uh, the bigger vision was like, well, if we solve this, then maybe we could get to, um, y- you know, the other vision later, which is, uh, you know, being a sort of a hiring platform. Yeah. Yeah. So we just had to formulate a story that kind of made sense and um, and then kind of pitch it again. And did it, it go pretty well, I'm assuming? Yeah, I think, um, I think especially now more than ever, um, you know, that was maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, you know, investors just want to be treated like human beings, right? Very <laughs> they true. don't want to be lied to, right? I mean, so yes. lying is the worst. That, like, that don't is ever do true. that, we'd say. So <laughs> if you kind of like kind of teach them, like kind of tell them what you've learned through mm. your journey so far and kind of have thoughtful alternatives or plans of, how you're going to tackle hard problems. Uh, yeah. I think they tend to keep believing you. Right. And, yeah. and they keep on putting, you know, uh, their investment in you. And that's, that's an important piece. You know, another great golden nugget that you're dropping for this listeners at home is the capital investors, angel investors. They're, they're not really, don't get me wrong. They are definitely looking at your books and are definitely looking at the product and assuming, you know, and, and trying to ensure that it's going to be successful. But at the end of the day, they're really investing in the entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. You know, they're, they're building that relationship. And, and to your point, they want to be treated like people and they trust, they don't trust is big. Don't lie. <laughs> they're <laughs> giving you a lot of money, you know, for, for the younger, you know, for, or, or for individuals that are interested in product development, doesn't matter the age, right? Individuals that are just interested in product development. What advice would you have for them from your experience? So I would say, um, you know, a common question maybe I get a lot is, um, or a common scenario is, yeah, I have an idea and I want to start a business. Um, where, where do I start? Um, like you said, a lot of times investors think about the people first. So I, I, I might start at the people where when if you're building software, let's say, usually the couple people that are in the room when you start is a developer mm-hmm. and the person who has product vision, right? Sometimes called the CEO, sometimes just called the co-founder. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those two people are critical. Um, so if you're a product developer or a product designer um, wanting to get into entrepreneurship, um, it's good. You're one of the two people <laughs> to be in the room. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you're already at a good start. Yeah, a work work with a good developer. You know, uh, talk to customers and design something that really fits a need, right? And once you design that thing that fits a need, build an MVP, see if it works. And, and all these things that I just said really shouldn't take more than maybe a, maybe two months, 
uh, to do. Like, do it really quick. And if you fail, fail fast is kind of what they yeah. say. And, and you, so MVP, what for the listeners at home, what is an MVP? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, M- MVP is minimum viable product. Uh, the smallest product that you can build um, to get some validation, really, is what I'd say. There you go. And so that's like a functioning product, though, correct? Yeah, functioning product. Yeah. So, I mean, some other people would might even be more bullish to say like, um, uh, you know, a product that, or, or it's something that someone will sign up for. Okay. But in my opinion, it's, you know, a functioning product um, that people could actually pay for. Nice. Uh, if, if it's a paid product. Nice. So for the folks at home that are interested in Podbox, interested in finding out more about you, where can they go? Where can they find you on the social media? Sure. They could find me on Twitter at Pat Chung. Uh, they could find Pod Inbox at uh, Twitter, Pod Inbox or podinbox.com. Nice. Pat Again, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Awesome. You just dropped so many good golden nuggets for the listeners at home. I really hope, folks, you really do take advice from Pat and what he's saying. Really do get out there and get in front of your consumers, listen to their needs, identify their needs, and then once you tackle their needs, you will probably have a very successful product, right? Yep. Pat, thank you again so much. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.